Vietnam has either surrendered or been killed. Assassination and revolution. Companions of change. Braganza noblemen have ruled Portugal for centuries. Now, with King Carlos dead, the Republic replaced the monarchy. But more than the government had changed. Portugal, one of the most Catholic countries in the world, was subjected to religious persecution. These victorious revolutionaries saw the church as the enemy. It had supported the state and must pay a price. One action among many was to exile the church's highest authority, the Cardinal Patriarch. They sought social change, political objectives, but there was much more at stake. What they could not see was their role in an emerging grand design, a mosaic that reveals itself only when we look at a series of seemingly unrelated events, events that many believe hold profound significance for the world today. Pieces of the puzzle include a world at war, Rasputin, his unnatural power, his violent death, execution of Nicholas II, Tsar of Russia, the slaying of the Empress and their children, the Bolshevik Revolution, Lenin's rise to power, and the strange and beautiful experience of three children. Young shepherds tending their flock amid these Serra d'Aire mountains of Portugal in the year 1917. More than 70,000 experienced the climax to the children's story. Among this crowd are five people who will tell us what they saw. Five witnesses to the miracle of the sun. What really happened at the Cova da Iria in 1917? We'll examine the events and their implications for us, for our time. Is there a thread that can be followed that ties past to present and present to our future? That explains why millions throughout the world remember three shepherd children why millions are committed to act, to respond to the message of Fatima. It doesn't seem to me this can be dismissed as an illusion, uh, much less as a hoax or a fraud. Uh, something happened there. And then they said that Our Lady asked them to continue to go to the Covaderia every 13th of every month. I look upon the, the miraculous happenings with skepticism. On the other hand, uh, I know that um, the miraculous happenings do, do happen. Went together with four young men because we were thinking what that... What could we do? That could be something bad. Bad people, bad It could people. be something bad, they said. Uh, there were many in the church who were skeptical. So the church wasn't pushing for this. The church wasn't uh, encouraging people to believe it. Uh, they came because they did believe what they had heard. And uh, the uh, this kind of event of this magnitude is just not that common, especially in our time where there is so much unbelief. Belief, disbelief. Three children had predicted a public miracle. Identify the date, time, and place. An extraordinary event had occurred. Newspaper accounts appeared worldwide. They referred to the miracle of the sun. Many expressed great doubt. There was skepticism concerning the dancing sun, the prophecies. The secret, the message of Fatima. In the past, revelation was widely accepted as a source of knowledge. Why not today in the age of science, an age influenced by technology and humanism? Dr. Paul Kurtz offers an answer. I think what's very important in the present loss of spirituality is the development of the Renaissance first with the secularization of morals and second the development of modern science 
with modern science, the great emphasis is upon reason and evidence and on the sense that man can control his own destiny. And so the modern world has this whole theme that man is the center of concern and not God. You know, all these inventions that we are so proud of have taken place in my lifetime. I remember the world when there was no electricity, no telephone, no macadamized roads, no motor cars, none of these things. In these images of progress, we see man as inventor, builder, dreamer. By the year 1914, many have come to believe all problems can be solved. Only good can follow the applications of scientific knowledge. Solutions packaged in a box labeled progress. Out of that box comes the specter of World War I. It's the summer of 1916, the summer of Verdun, the Battle of the Somme. There is intense suffering on both sides. Two and a quarter million casualties on the Western Front. It would seem no place on earth could be further removed from the destruction, the horror of war, than the Serra d'Aire Mountains of Portugal, where farmers and shepherds regard the conflict as little more than a distant rumor. Fatima, 1917. For three young children tending their sheep, it is the best of times. Warner Brothers portray them, Hollywood fashion, in a feature film released in 1952. Here, in fact, are the very children. Lucia dos Santos, age 10. Her cousin, Jacinta Marto, seven. And Jacinta's brother, nine-year-old Francisco. They would go through the trap door when the family was gone and hide above us. They were there and we didn't know it. The three would hide for hours, always playing, running, jumping, hiding under the stairs. Yes, they were like all children, hiding, joking, always playing together. <laughs> that winter, Huge armies battle each other and the elements. Trench warfare continues. The slaughter continues. Three shepherd children who could neither read nor write, living in a small village 90 miles from Lisbon, might have limited knowledge of the Great War. But to better understand what happened to them in 1917, we need to examine historical events of which they could have little knowledge, if any events unfolding thousands of miles away in Russia. It's the world's largest single state, ruled for centuries by an arrogant autocracy, ruled by the Tsar in the name of God. For these last of the European serfs to be freed, life was harsh, filled with injustices. Ownership of the land was a crucial issue. In the cities, those whose backs were bent under the yoke of the Industrial Revolution faced new dangers, new fears, old tyrannies. By the turn of the century, there were widespread disturbances fed by bitterness, hopelessness. Father Giorgi Gapon organized a society of workers. They sought to present a peaceful petition for relief, and on a Sunday in January 1905, marched on the Winter Palace at St. Petersburg, marched singing, God save the Tsar. The emperor's troops fired into the crowd. Hundreds were mowed down. It was Bloody Sunday. Portraits of the Tsar and the crosses they carried fell with them. Autumn, 1905. Following a general strike in the city, a frightened Nicholas II agrees to the formation of a legislative council. It would have limited powers and be called the Duma. The people would see little change in their lives. In the later years of his reign, particularly just before World War I, uh, the uh, advisors became increasingly under the control of Rasputin, uh, the uh, so-called monk who was the most evil influence on Nicholas, and his wife became a bad influence because 
uh, she was more concerned than anything else with the survival of her son, who had hemophilia, and she believed that only Rasputin could heal him, could make him well when he had one of the bleeding episodes, and therefore uh, the whole government came increasingly under Rasputin's control, uh, whom everyone knew outside the Tsar's family to be an evil man. There is no evidence that Rasputin had any sincere religious belief at all. There is some evidence that he was involved, at least in his early years, in various satanic cults and rites. There is very substantial evidence that toward the end of his life, uh, he possessed supernatural powers uh, of satanic origin. He, it is the clearest case uh, that I know of in history where a man who played a major historic role uh, at a critical moment in history, where there is substantial, solid evidence uh, that he was exercising powers which could only have come from hell. 1914, Russia is drawn into World War I. Poorly trained, poorly armed, their first year in battle, two million Russians are killed, wounded, or captured. Every great war from the 19th century on had led to a crisis in this essentially static, agrarian, militarized empire. And World War I being the most destructive, the most um, uh, psychologically destructive, as well as physically disruptive war of, of modern times, really, in many ways, it hit the Russian Empire just like a thunderclap, and it wasn't able ever really to recover. Rasputin's influence over government appointments and decisions proves disastrous. So long as he lives, his power over the Empress, and therefore the nation, will be complete. Russian statesmen, and even some members of the royal family, convinced the fate of their country is at stake, seek his death. Rasputin is lured to Prince Yusupov's home, and is poisoned, shot, beaten, finally drowned. March 1917. Holy Mother Russia, disillusioned by military defeats, unable to meet the very basic needs of her people, sees starvation, food riots, rebellion. The Tsar's government is not overthrown. It collapses. Within 16 months, a Rasputin prophecy will be fulfilled with the death of the royal family. The Bolsheviks will execute Nicholas, Alexandra, and their children. A provisional democratic government prepares for an election. Under the new freedoms, revolutionaries, enemies of the imperial regime, return to Russia. A great many revolutionaries came back from abroad. Stalin and Molotov were in Siberia. Lenin was in Zurich, in Switzerland. Um, the Bolsheviks were one of the smallest of the parties within the broad uh, coalition of revolutionary parties, but they took advantage of the freedoms. Lenin came back in April 1917 on the so-called sealed train. As Churchill once put it, sealed like a plague bacillus. Lenin, there's a fundamental importance in understanding the Russian Revolution. It could not have happened without him. All of the other situations that existed that made a revolution possible, that sort of opened the way to it, uh, none of them would have resulted in a revolution, in my opinion, if it hadn't been for Lenin's presence. Lenin's uh, presence was critical, determined to destroy the whole existing system in Russia as he was. He achieved his objective and brought a horror upon his native land, which is still there. The Russian Revolution of 1917 is the most important secular event in the history of this century. Uh, just as the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima, which came at the same time, uh, is, uh, could well be described as the most important uh, religious event, and the two are obviously very closely related. By 1917, Portugal's been drawn into the war. Uh, but in the many small Portuguese villages, issues involved in the conflict and the rise of Marxism in Russia are little known or debated, uh, certainly not understood by the children. Better known is the revolution that touched their own lives since the assassination of King Carlos. In 1910, uh, with the change of the regime under the leadership of Masons, the church came under attack. The new government promised that within two generations, they would make an end of religion and faith in Portugal. This was the beginning of the persecution of the church. 
In Lisbon and in other large cities, church property is seized. Hundreds of priests and nuns imprisoned or exiled. Those allowed to remain are forbidden to wear clerical dress. The traditional Catholic matrimonial mass is not allowed. Marriages are authorized by civil contract only. The great monasteries and abbeys are converted into barracks and government buildings. In the cities, church authorities experience a reign of terror. In the remote village of Fatima, conditions are less severe. They have a priest, Father Ferreira. May 13th, 1917. In a grassy depression among the hills outside the village, 10-year-old Lucia dos Santos and cousins Jacinta and Francisco first see the Lady of Fatima. Lucia remains the only living witness. The children will undergo many interrogations. For a graphic description of what occurred, we turn to those transcripts and to Lucia's memoirs written in 1935. It was a clear day, the sun shining, when at noontime suddenly we saw a flash of lightning. We began to run, then ahead of us, we saw a beautiful lady, about 16 years of age, dressed all in white. She was surrounded by a brilliant radiance. We stopped about five feet away from where she was standing, atop a small evergreen. She said, do not be afraid. I asked where she came from. I am from heaven, she said. I've come to ask you to come here for six months in succession on the 13th day at this same hour. Then I'll tell you who I am and what I wish. The beautiful lady then asked if the children would be willing to accept certain sufferings that would come to them and offer those sufferings to God so that sinners would be converted. Lucia replied, yes, we will. They were asked to pray the rosary every day to obtain peace for the world and an end to the war. She then began to rise serenely going up toward the east and disappeared in the immensity of space. Francisco sees the apparition but cannot hear what is said. Jacinta and Lucia see and hear all, but it is Lucia alone with whom the lady speaks. And it is Lucia who warns her cousins not to tell anyone what has happened. Seven-year-old Jacinta, unable to contain her happiness, tells her parents. They are puzzled, but know their two youngest children are truthful. When the story reaches Lucia's mother and father, the reaction is quite different. From Lucia's mother, a devout Catholic, there is total disbelief. Then harsh words and threats to persuade the child to give up this tale. Despite her mother's anger, even beatings, despite ridicule and abuse from others in the village, Lucia and her cousins wait in great expectation for June 13th. Wait to see again the Lady of Fatima, the lady they believe to be the Virgin Mary. Feast day of St. Anthony, June 13th. A holiday atmosphere eagerly awaited by all the children of the village. But Lucia, Jacinta and Francisco are not diverted. They return to the cova as the lady requested. Word of the May apparition has spread. There are more than 50 strangers present. The children's parents are not there. We were there, five young men with our staves of wood to protect my cousin Lucy, to protect the children. It was rumored there might be trouble. They were finishing praying the rosary when we got there, and we sat down. The children pointed, that's where the lightning came from before. And soon after, the lightning did come, a live lightning. Then they said, kneel in front of Our Lady and raise your hands. We were standing there in front of her like a piece of wood, afraid that something bad was going afraid. to happen. We were afraid. Yeah. Lucia, Jacinta and Francisco knelt before Our Lady. Lucia asked, what do you want today? Lucia said kneel because Our Lady is coming. And Lucia, Jacinta and Francisco did kneel. Some people thought it was a hoax. Others, 
thought it might be about the end of the war. No one else sees the Lady of Fatima, but the children say she came in the same way and to the same place, atop a small three-foot evergreen. As before, Lucia speaks freely with the beautiful lady and asks her to take them to heaven with her. Yes, Jacinta and Francisco, I will take soon. But you are to stay here some time longer. Jesus wishes to make use of you to make me acknowledged and loved. I wish you to come here on the 13th of next month to pray the rosary every day and learn to read. Later, I will tell you what I want. The children are questioned by their parish priest. Father Ferreira says they are telling the truth about what they believe they saw. But the priest is deeply worried. He tells them it might be a deception of the devil. Terrified, Lucia decides not to return to the Cova Iria July 13th. The Passchendaele Offensive, launched by the Allies. It is July 1917. The British will attack in the mud for three nightmarish months. Their destination? Submarine pens on the Belgian coast, 40 miles away. Poet Paul Nash captures the horror. Evil and the incarnate fiend is master of this war. No glimmer of God's hand anywhere. The rain drives on, the shells never cease. Annihilating, maiming, maddening, they plunge into the grave which is this land, one huge grave. It is unspeakable, godless, hopeless. Noon, July 13th, the devout and the curious gather in the Copa. They wait to see what will happen. Despite her fears, at the last minute, Lucia decides to join her two cousins. My sister and my aunt were there with Lucia. There were many people behind the walls. The stones where today we find the basilica. We could see only the heads, looking and observing. And when we came down the road, a man said to me, Hey, young man, why are you going there? Don't you think that it could be some punishment sent by God? We stayed like that, stiff. And then I thought, my sister and my aunt are there. If they go, everybody should go together. This day's message from the Lady of Fatima is the most serious of all. A prophecy. A warning that will hold profound significance for our world today. Lucia asks the Lady for a miracle so that all will believe the message. The answer? In October, I will perform a miracle. What happened next would have been more than they could bear had they not been told all three would go to heaven. For the children were then shown a momentary vision of hell, followed by this prophecy. The war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given you by God, that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the Church and the Holy Father. The prophecy continues. If people do not stop offending God, Russia will spread errors throughout the world. The good will be martyred. Several nations annihilated. But that in the end, a certain period of peace will be granted the world. Then the three are told a secret, a secret to be given only to the Pope. The children reported at Fatima that uh, Mary had uh, asked for prayers for the conversion of Russia, that she had foretold that in fact Russia eventually would be converted, that uh, Russia would spread uh, many errors throughout the world prior to the conversion, prior to its conversion, and that there would be the destruction of nations as part of that process.
Educated, knowledgeable Portuguese were astonished at the inclusion of Russia in the children's reports. Russia? Unable to feed its own people, economically depressed, third from the bottom in world literacy, on the verge of a revolution? Russia? Hardly a prospect to become a world fit, a superpower state. It's rather interesting from a historical point of view because the Bolshevik Revolution had not as yet occurred when the appearance at Fatima took place. It was still a couple of months in the future. And um, even had it occurred, it's unlikely that these three peasant children in Portugal would have comprehended what was involved. Ostensibly, in 1917, Russia was still a very religious nation. It belonged to the Russian Orthodox Church. It was very religious, one of the most religious nations in the world. So it's rather interesting that they should cast Russia in the role of the disseminator of false ideas and speak of the need for Russia's conversion, uh, which is not what people would have thought about it in 1917. After the visitation, the children repeat the promise of the Virgin Mary. A miracle will occur October 13th. And how do others, even those who are present, respond to their words? Most consider the children's report a work of fiction, unacceptable, unbelievable. The children seek ways to sacrifice, to obtain the conversion of sinners, to save them from the hell they have seen. Their lunches, they give to poorer children. When thirsty, they drink no water. Again, each child is questioned by Father Ferreira. This time, the priest, the pastor, remain silent. Cova da Iria, August 13th, 1917. 6,000 people gather for the announced visitation, but the anti-religious government, increasingly concerned by reports of apparitions and the growing crowds, takes action. Administrator of the district, Arturo de Oliveira Santos, unable to persuade the children to change their story, kidnaps them. At Cova da Iria, there is no visitation. Bitter, disappointed pilgrims return to their homes for some a distance of many miles. In the city of Orem, the district capital, the three children are prisoners, threatened with torture, with death, if they will not admit the visitations are a hoax. Their story does not change. They will not lie. The next morning, another interrogation. If there really was a beautiful lady of Fatima, the man Santos, tell me the secret she revealed to you. Seven, eight, Speak up, this is and ten answer. years of age, three children confronted by this furious symbol of authority, hold firm. Jacinta is removed from the room. Lucia and Francisco are told she is being boiled in oil. Santos demands they confess. Although terrified, their story still does not change. And Francisco is led away. Though certain her beloved cousins have been put to death, Lucia will not tell Santos what he wants to hear. Take him from the room, apprehensive, fearful. She's amazed to see what she least expects. Her cousins, alive. Though they are children, the three are placed in a cell with other prisoners. August 15th, the jailers release them to frantic parents. Four days later, Lucia, Francisco, and his brother, John Marto, are in nearby Valinos tending their sheep. We spoke with John Marto. My sister Jacinta had been in jail, so she had lice on her head and our mother was treating her. That's the reason she stayed at home and I was with the others. Lucia saw something moving in the sky. It was Our Lady. She was approaching. Lucia asked me to get Jacinta, quickly. She insisted. She said, it's no good to have the priest without the acolyte. I went and whispered in Jacinta's ear. Lucia said that you should go there, to Valinos, and be with her. They said they had seen Our Lady, but I didn't see anything. They said Our Lady had appeared. And Jacinta took a small branch of grapevine to bring home. 
When she arrived at Lucia's house, she said to Lucia's mother, Oh, aunt, we saw a lady in Valinos. She could not believe, but she smelled the small branch and felt its wonderful smell. Jacinta started running to our house, to this house. Our father was seated at the fireplace. He asked her what it was, and she said, This is from the feet of Our Lady. She put one here, and another one over there. At Valinos, the lady tells the children not to be afraid. She promises to return to the Cova da Iria. Lucia asks about the coins left by the visitors. Uh, what shall be done with the money? The reply, it's for the chapel which the people will build. Sunrise, September 13th. They eagerly await the hour of visitation. Thousands of pilgrims from all parts of Portugal and Spain are at the Cova da Iria. The main highway is so jammed, people find it almost impossible to move. The shortest of the visitations occurs. Just before Lucia speaks, it appears to witnesses the top of the small evergreen bends and curves, as if under a weight. I was at Fatima when the apparition happened, at the Cova de Iria in September 1917. But I did not talk with the visionaries because I still had doubts about the apparitions. And the priests tried to turn us away from the place. Who knows if this wasn't something invented by the devil to destroy the church? The Passchendaele Offensive, the campaign in the mud in Flanders in 1917, is of real significance in understanding the events of that year and the reasons for Our Lady's apparition at Fatima. Because, in a sense, this was the climax of the evil and the horror of the military side of World War I. October 13th. 1917. It rains heavily through night. The same storm endured by the soldiers fighting and dying in Flanders falls on those who have assembled at the Cova da Iria. More than 70,000 have gathered from every walk of life, some hoping to view the promised miracle, some to taunt this display of medieval supernaturalism. The most important influential newspapers in the country have been carrying stories for weeks critical of the events at Fatima. It has become a principal target of the anti-clerical press, the butt of jokes, the subject of columns of satire. Avelino d'Almeida, an outspoken skeptic regarding the apparitions, witnesses the occasion. He is the managing editor of O Seculo, the largest newspaper in Lisbon. His written account appears on the front page. A spectacle unique and incredible if one had not been a witness to it. One can see the crowd turn toward the sun, which reveals itself free of clouds at full noon. The great star of the day makes one think of a silver plaque, and it is possible to look on it without the least discomfort. It might be an eclipse, but now it bursts forth in a colossal clamor we hear spectators cry, Miracle, Miracle, Marvel, Marvel. Before the astonished crowd, the sun trembled, made brusque movements, unprecedented and outside of all cosmic law. The sun has danced. We said, Lucia, if it is true that you can see Our Lady, why don't you ask her to perform some miracle for everybody to see? And Lucia said, Our Lady says on October 13th, something will happen for everybody to see. My mother always argued, saying that Our Lady couldn't make miracles for everybody to see. She could make miracles, but not for everybody to see. But when she saw the miracle of the sun, she could really believe. I saw, and, and my sister also, and my mother shouted, here is the miracle promised by Our Lady, in the sun for everybody to see. It was a light rain when Lucia said, close your umbrellas because Our Lady is going to appear. 
It seemed that the sun was saying goodbye to the sky and coming down like a saucer, singing and working and coming down and stopped only when it almost reached the ground. Then my mother believed. Everybody was amazed. And it rained so much. The weather was like today. Later, the sun came out, and after midday, the sun started teasing, teasing, teasing. Everybody was frightened. Oh my God, everybody was frightened. And the colors appeared like a rainbow near the bottom of the hill. We thought we would die. But thanks, God, nobody died. And we saw a shadow, a shadow. And it was bright like lightning, lightning on the north. During the miracle, everybody knelt down on that wet earth and everything. Everybody knelt down and, and was screaming, asking for mercy and saying, miracle, miracle. It was Our Lady, a miracle for everybody to see. And they believed. After the miracle, everything was dry, completely dry. As reported by those present and confirmed by newspaper accounts, the phenomenon lasted approximately 12 minutes. The sun zigzagging in the sky, reflecting brilliant multi-hued colors on the upturned faces, the trees, and earth, and climaxing with the sun plunging down toward the thousands gathered in the Kova. Many thought the end of the world had come. It suddenly reversed itself, returning to its normal position in the sky. Yet another extraordinary phenomenon, all that had been soaked by the rain, was now dry ground and people. Theories of mass hypnotism, of autosuggestion, were discarded when it was discovered that many reliable witnesses at great distances from the Kova had seen the solar phenomenon. Among them, the poet Alfonso Lopez Vieira. He saw it from his home at San Pedro, 40 kilometers from Fatima. Interrogation transcripts reveal the three children see Jesus who blesses the crowd. It is on this day, October 13th, 1917, the beautiful lady declares herself saying, I am the lady of the rosary. The three shepherd children, what does the future hold for them? During the June appearance, the lady said that Jacinta and her brother Francisco would soon be with her in heaven, but that Lucia would live longer that Jesus wished Lucia to remain in the world. Within 28 months, brother and sister, Francisco and Jacinta, are dead. For Lucia, intense loneliness follows the deaths of her cousins. She is happy to agree with her parents and Bishop José da Silva's suggestion that she, at age 14, enter the Dorothean Sisters' School in the city of Porto. Later, as Sister Mary Lucia of the Immaculate Heart, she enters a cloistered convent of the Scalced Carmelites. November 7th, 1917, 2 a.m. Bolsheviks seize the Baltic Railroad and Telegraph offices. At dawn, the State Bank and Telephone Exchange. At 8 a.m., the Bolsheviks know they have won. Now, obviously, what Fatima has taught us is being realized because communism is spreading its errors throughout the world. And when I say communism, I mean a basically materialistic, anti-religious philosophy. This is basically what communism is under the cover of social reforms. Now, as a Christian, I'm passionately for social justice, wherever it can be established but definitely not under the cover of atheism. In 1917, the Lady of Fatima told the three children she would come again to speak further with Lucia concerning two requests. The first, 
that Holy Communion be received on the first Saturday of five successive months to be offered in reparation. This apparition came to pass December 10th, 1925. The second request, the consecration of Russia by the Pope. In the year 1929, on June 25th, the Blessed Trinity and the Virgin Mary appeared to Sister Lucia in her convent chapel. Our Lady said that the moment had come to ask the Holy Father to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary with all the bishops of the world in order to gain world peace. Subsequent popes did enact this consecration, this entrustment of Russia to God through the Virgin Mary in various manners. In 1932, after 15 years of ecclesiastical investigation, the Bishop of Fatima and Rome declared the Fatima miracle and message worthy of belief. Our Lady said the war was going to end, but if the world didn't improve, didn't live according to religious principles, there would be another and worse war during the reign of Pius XI. There will be a sign, a night illumined by an unknown light, and by this great sign, Lucia will know that God is going to punish the world for its crimes by means of another and greater war. January 25th, 1938 is the night illumined by an unknown light. Newspapers headline the event in Germany, Switzerland, Spain, in Hungary, Norway, Italy, Greece, and the United States. In Europe, the sky was said to be like a furnace a glow with crimson fire seen from the North Sea to the Adriatic from nine at night to two in the morning. Lucia, seeing it from her convent window, recognizes it as the sign. 47 days after the great light, Sunday, March 13th, Hitler invades Austria. It's the Anschluss, prophecy fulfilled. The curtain is raised on World War II. Man's inhumanity to man has never been more evident. An estimated 40 million casualties, far in excess of World War I. Here, 70,000 men, women, and children are killed or injured in an instant. Hiroshima falls to the atom bomb. When Solzhenitsyn arrived in the Western world, he's a person I admire very much, he said immediately, what is wrong with you Western people is that you have lost your sense of good and evil. And it is true that without an awareness of good and evil, it is impossible for us to live coherently uh, at all. Two superpowers emerged from World War II. The United States and Russia emerged to become involved in a Cold War, an ideological battle between democracy and communism. 1950, Korea. The homeless, the refugees, the dead. 1960, Vietnam homeless, the refugees, the dead. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted. If not, she will continue to spread her errors, causing wars. Where this sister now prays, in the chapel of Sister Lucia's convent in Portugal, there stands a statue of Mary. Sister Lucia worked with a sculptor for six months and says it's a good likeness, the best that she has seen. On the convent wall, passers-by are reminded of present-day communist attacks on the church. This graffiti reads, religion is the opiate of the people. The secret of Fatima given to the three children by the Virgin Mary in 1917 has been the subject of infinite, continuing speculation. In 1942, the writings of Sister Lucia 
including the secret in a separate envelope, were sent to the Bishop of Leria. In 1957, the writings were sent to Rome. Pope John XXIII opened the envelope, read its contents, and kept it secret. Each subsequent pope was given the letter containing the secret, and a cardinal certainly read it, because it was mentioned to me during a conference. I was told Cardinal Ottaviani had read it. The pope showed it to him, and it will be published only when the pope wishes it to be. In many parts of the world, in different countries, many versions of the secret of Fatima have appeared. I have often received stories and articles published in newspapers and magazines concerning the secret, written as if the secret were known to the author. There were so many, I decided to contact Sister Lucia myself, because these stories describe apocalyptic events tell of disgraces that will befall humanity, of nations that will disappear, including descriptions of actual contemporary political situations that we are experiencing. I felt it was my duty as the present Bishop of Maria Fatima, as someone responsible for the authenticity of the message, it was my duty to clarify it. I contacted Sister Lucia. She said that nothing like this was mentioned in these supernatural communications that she received. In any event, we know the message of Fatima. It is enough to change our life. The message of Fatima is enough. It moves us to continue our contribution to the salvation of our society. And this is what is important. Reverend Dr. Manuel Formigao, canon of the Cathedral of Lisbon, professor at the seminary of Santarem, interrogated the children. He saw them separately. He asked the same question. Would the crowd, the people, be sad if they knew the secret? From each child, the same reply. Yes, they would. To a similar question asked by pilgrims in 1917, Lucia said only, good for some. For others, bad. Transformation of the covert idea to the spiritual harbor seen here testifies to the belief, to the faith of millions of persons from throughout the world, visitors to the Basilica. Fatima continues to be the site of many physical miracles, yet spiritual conversions dominate. We are receiving three million pilgrims each year. I would like Fatima to be the refuge of pilgrims and the way which leads them to God. For Jacinta and Francisco, beatification and canonization proceedings are in progress. First in church history for children who had not been martyred. One of the prophecies speaks of a pope who will have much to suffer. The Pope lies wounded, but the attempt to kill has failed, and the gunman is captured. Italian authorities and other investigators discover evidence linking the would-be assassin to East European communists. The place, St. Peter's Square. The date, May 13th, 1981. The anniversary of the Virgin Mary's first appearance at Fatima. One year later, May 13th, 1982, Pope John Paul II convinced the Blessed Mother preserved his life on that fateful day, undertakes a pilgrimage to the Cova d'Iria, to Fatima, where he gives thanks to the Lady of the Rosary. Holy Mother of God, I am here today, united with all the pastors of the church. We entrust and consecrate to you those individuals and nations which particularly need to be entrusted. You who have a mother's awareness of all the struggles between good and evil, accept this cry. We have recourse to your protection. Reject not our prayers. From nuclear war, from every kind of war, 
deliver us. From readiness to trample on the commandments of God, deliver us. May merciful love put a stop to evil. Sister Lucia is present. She had left Fatima as a girl of 14. Now, 62 years later, she returns to view the remarkable change that has occurred in her village. She's filled with joy to be present with the Pope and over a million and a half persons from virtually every nation of the world. In light of the threat of nuclear annihilation, the absence of peace in our world on virtually every level, Fatima emerges as both a sobering warning and a message of hope, a plan, a direction, not only for military, for political peace, but direction on how to find peace on a personal level. Statistics confirm an unprecedented rise in the use of drugs, in abortion, crime, child abuse, alcoholism, mental sickness, immorality. During the Fatima appearance of July 13th, the Virgin Mary gave three means as the ultimate answer to problems of everyday life. The answer to individual needs, daily prayer, to make sacrifices, to pray the rosary. If Western men persist in seeking satisfaction through power, sin is certainly the forgotten word in our time, through money. It's true that uh, concepts like sin and hell have become very unpopular. Through erotic excitement. Our society publicly assumes God does not exist. Through indulgence in drugs, all these different things that they're doing to try and give their life some point they will destroy themselves and their way of life. And that, that will be God's way of indicating that such a view of life and such a way of life is not viable. Underneath it all, I think large numbers of Westerners understand that higher meaning, any kind of true meaning, has disappeared. And the only meaning that's left is the personal meaning of their personal life, their career, their particular goals. And that's about all they care about. And uh, so um, I would say that self-preoccupation and careerism are the psychological preoccupations that keep people from being aware of the emptiness in their life. Freud conquered the American public completely and totally and says the key to happiness is sex. So there was a sexual revolution and everyone tried it, or most people tried it, in and out, and they're bored by it. The new rock groups, the new uh, forms of art are preoccupied with, uh, with anger, with uh, hatred, in many cases with death quite deliberately. I feel deeply pessimistic about what's going to happen to the civilization that we belong to, to this way of life that's come about in a sense, the modern West is the first society in the history of the world which is experimenting with the possibility of uh, radical moral uncertainty. To my mind, the conflict between moral good and moral evil is a crucial question of human life. The Fatima message is not, in fact, original or startlingly new. It's the very timeless Christian message, Jewish message, repent your sins. Fatima is not a crusade against Russia. Fatima is a crusade, but a crusade of prayer and of penance, of offering of our lives for the conversion of Russia and of all men who don't adore and who don't love God and mankind, finally. If we persist in going on the path that we have trodden on for quite a while, and we forget God, we forget the purpose and meaning of human existence, there's every reason to be extraordinarily pessimistic because now we have means of self-destruction. And I mean, if these means of self-destruction are put at the service of evil, the world can be annihilated. 
All attempts to find a way out of the plight of today's world are fruitless without a repentant return of our consciousness to the creator of all. Without this, no exit will be illumined and we should be unable to find our way. Instead of the ill-advised hopes of the last two centuries, which have reduced us to insignificance and brought us to the brink of nuclear and non-nuclear death, we can only reach with determination for the warm hand of God, which we have so rashly and self-confidently pushed away. If we did this, our eyes could be opened to the errors of this unfortunate 20th century, and our hands could be directed to set them right. Our five continents are caught in a whirlwind. If we perish and lose this world, the fault will be ours alone. The children of Fatima were told by the Virgin Mary that the miracle would be performed so that all might believe the message, that prayer and penance are gravely needed, that this is the answer to the plight of today's world. The message of Fatima, return to God.